Welcome to our final lecture for Unit 2. This is the Rococo outside of France, England, Italy, and a bit in Germany. So a couple of big names to keep an eye out for in England, William Hogarth, his uh, painting called uh, Marriage a la Mode. We'll also be looking at portraits by Gainsborough and Reynolds. We'll look at the Italian painters Canaletto and Capello and the German sculptor Assam. So Hogarth is a pretty fascinating character for us, I think, uh, especially when we think about telling narratives in visual imagery. So we already saw a painting cycle in the stories, or paintings rather, that told the story of the life of Marie de Medici. This is a similar approach in a way, although not a true, quote unquote, true story of a real person. This is a kind of moralizing story that William Hogarth is telling. This series is called The Rake's Progress, and he did actually create a series of um, scenes about this young man and his terrible uh, choices in life and how it negatively affects him. It plays a bit like a soap opera. We get to have sort of the fun of watching someone commit really bad um, behaviors to um, behave in, in terrible ways. We get the enjoyment of that, but we also get to watch him get his comeuppance. So it's kind of a funny uh, story in a way. It's a very British approach to Rococo uh, naughtiness. In France, we saw a lot of Rococo paintings that were very much about gay topics and romantic events, uh, but they weren't played for the judgment of the characters who are engaging in the affairs in the British style, um, especially with Hogarth, we really get kind of a cake and eat it situation. We get to indulge in the naughty behavior, but we also get to see the bad person get their comeuppance. So what's happening here is really quite tragic. Um, the rake, which is basically a male version of a harlot, it's somebody who is... Um, not concerned with other people in any way and only concerned with his own desires. Uh, the rake is rejecting his fiance, who is pregnant, <laughs> and he is just now uh, inheriting his father's fortune. So he doesn't need her any longer. He wants to spend his money and have kind of um, all the excess in his life that he possibly can get. And so he's rejecting her, and you can clearly see that this is a negative effect for her. What you're seeing here is the from the painting, and that's actually what made Hogarth's money. He created these painting cycles, this series of images telling a narrative story in sequence, but then he made money by selling the set as engraved prints that were printed on paper and could be collected, put in frames, displayed. Um, and it was really a clever move on his part to use this uh, printmaking technology to kind of further his own career. And of course, it also us further down the road of artists establishing copyright for their work. You see here the second scene of the rake's progress. This is the levy. This is the rake being given lessons in uh, swordplay, in uh, music, in all kinds of indulgences, and he's not at all concerned with business or doing anything responsible whatsoever. There's the engraving. This is the obvious consequence of what would happen after such an activity. You would end up, of course, at an orgy, and so that's what you see here. He's quite drunk, and uh, you can see there's even a woman in the background who seems to be setting fire to the entire place with a candle burning a painting. See her again there. This is the rake being arrested or about to be arrested. And instead of being arrested for having gone into that, his former girlfriend, right, the fiance that he rejected, is trying to save him by giving him all of her hard earned money. Tragic. You can see that he's getting married for convenience, not to the woman that he should have married, probably in the first scene, but to a much older and obviously very wealthy woman whom he expects to die soon so that he can get hold of her money. And in the very background, you see his rejected 
girlfriend with the that she had by him a very tragic, right? Very horrible person. Well, as expect, as soon as he has his hands on some money, he starts to lose the money. This is his night in the gaming house. So he has just basically wasted all of the money that he gained from this this marriage of convenience. It's quite an unfortunate scene for him as well. Of course, he winds up in prison and you can see he is being put into um, a debtor's prison in this scene. And of course, now that he has been imprisoned, he's then going to go mad. And so you can even see that wealthy women are touring this insane asylum, which obviously is a horrible practice, but you can see that they're touring the the asylum as if to take entertainment from the behavior of these lost souls. And you can see that uh, the figure of the rejected uh, potential bride is still there trying to help him, and he's still ignoring her even at this last stage. So not to be outdone, there is also a series of harlots progress. And so this poor young girl comes to London and becomes entangled with a brothel keeper. We see that she now becomes the mistress of a wealthy merchant. She has become a full-on prostitute in this scene. It's just terrible, right? Um, she also ends up in prison, and here you see her beating hemp to create ropes, and the ropes, of course, will be used for hangings, so that's pretty terrible punishment. And now she ends up being from syphilis that she's contracted, and you see the two doctors are debating the different ways to treat her, both of which would have caused intense pain. One of them is advocating for draining her blood in a, a process known as bleating, which certainly would not have helped this scene at all. And here is her wake where they're literally pouring drinks and serving food off of her coffin. So you get all of the um, effects of the naughtiness, right? You get to see people doing terrible things. We get to kind of indulge ourselves there. But we also have the nice moral of seeing that they come to a bad end. So although these are truly painting cycles, I sometimes refer to them in quotation marks as painted morality plays, because Hogarth is really trying to give us a moral lesson. You certainly get that with Marriage a la Mode, and Marriage a la Mode, or Marriage um, of the Moment, Marriage of Fashion, is a story that really is kind of tragic. The characters who are about to be wed, you would think there's a woman and a man huddled together chatting. You would think that they are the couple, but in fact, that's not the case. The couple about to be wed are the two who are totally ignoring each other and completely uninterested in the activity that's taking place. Their fathers are working out the details of this marriage, and it's really kind of a marriage that is more to help the families or to help the fathers even than it is to uh, help their children who are going to have to wed each other. The Earl of Squander is the man over here who obviously has gout, and he is pointing to his family tree that shows that he is descended from William the Conqueror. So he has the aristocratic title, but no money. He's squandered all of his money. So he the marriage of his son, who has, of course, the title, to the daughter of this alderman. And so he is not an aristocrat. He doesn't have a title, but he has money. He's newly acquired wealth. So they can better each other's situations. You can gain the respectability of a title, and the titled family can gain the money. And so this is the only reason that the two young, quote unquote, lovers are being brought together at all. There's the engraving to show the story. And now the marriage is almost immediately hit the rocks. This is just scene two. This is the one to know for the test. Scene two, marriage a la mode breakfast scene. What is happening here, sometimes referred to as the tete-a-tete, -tete, is the, the morning after a night of kind of debauched partying. And in fact, the husband has been out all night. You can tell that because he's still got his cap 
and his jacket on. You can see Lady's handkerchiefs collected. They're being sniffed at by his dog. You can also see the implication that he may be developing syphilis as well. The big black spot on his neck is a sign of that. And you can see that his wife, who's not interested or really concerned that he's been out all night, has obviously been kind of partying herself. You can see the furniture is in kind of disarray. And their servant, who's trying to get them to deal with paying and being responsible, throws his hands up in disgust and walks out. They are as checked out from each other as they can be. The next scene is tragic. In this case, again, you can see the black spots indicating that they are uh, probably syphilitic, suffering from um, sexually transmitted diseases. You can see that here on him, and spots here on her. And what's happening now is that Squanderfield is visiting the French doctor. He's trying to get a syphilis treatment for himself and for this other age girl that he obviously is, and that's probably her mother who's arranging the whole thing. So he's cheating on his wife in a uh, terrible, terrible way and exploiting other women on top of it. He's an awful person. But she's not much better. Meanwhile, while he's sowing his wild oats, she has, now that she has the title and is able to spend all of her father's money, she and all of the fashionable things that she enjoys. She has got all kinds of fancy goods in front of her. And if you look closely, you can see that these things all still have their labels on them. She's just been spending money left, right, and center. She's hosting all of her friends for a party that just never ends. She's hired musicians and orators to perform. She's got the latest of fashionable fops all around her and her boyfriend there as well, of course. And notice in the background, you might recognize that painting. There's Jupiter and Io Correggio, so she's clearly spending some money, right? There's the engraving to tell that section of the story. And then, of course, things to go very tragically awry. Here is the Countess's boyfriend, pantsless, I might add, jumping out the window to escape. Her husband has suddenly decided to take an interest in his own marriage, and so he busts in on them in a hotel, um, and that hotel is above a Turkish bath, hence the turbans on the Turkish owner. You can see that the lover has fatally stabbed the husband, and so now she's been implicated essentially in a murder, and her boyfriend has abandoned her. And so, of course, it ends with the tragedy of the death of the lady. And you can see that sad story is going to continue. Her own child now seems to have contracted the syphilis that was haunting the family because of all of their sins. Notice the starving dog <laughs> destroying their food. It is almost laughable in some ways. It's kind of an over-the-top indictment of all of this behavior, but it does allow you the indulgence of looking at all of this naughtiness. So again, it truly is a painting cycle, but in quotation marks, we could refer to it as a painted morality play because we're clearly meant to get a lesson from it. Uh, the British painters are definitely a little more restrained and a little uh, more moralistic in their imagery, I suppose, than the French during the Rococo. And certainly we see that as the case with Thomas Gainsborough, one of the most fashionable of the portrait painters of his era. It becomes very common to see uh, during the Rococo era in a lot of cultures uh, in Western Europe and then even in America's wealthy people having their portraits made showing the lands that they own behind them. Uh, and you can see that in all of these examples by Thomas Gainsborough. One of his most famous, the blue boy, most likely the son of a friend. And another very famous piece of his, this is Robert Andrews and his young wife. They're very, very young, very wealthy landowners. And really the painting shows you um, this incredible expanse of property that they own. If you notice in her lap, it looks a little damaged. The painting is actually unfinished. This was intended so that once they had a child, the child could be added to that painting. 
Now, Gainsborough's perhaps most famous piece, and the one I want you to know for the test, is this portrait of Mrs. Sarah Siddons. Now, Sarah Siddons was a real person. Uh, she was a very famous actress, and at this stage, she was so successful that they uh, made jokes about how people weren't able to get into the theater. The lines were so long to get tickets and it was even difficult to get to see her on stage because she was so popular. But coming out of the tradition of Commedia dell'arte, we have established a, a culture that really likes theater, but that kind of looks down on the people who perform in it. And so she is presenting herself as a very, very proper lady. It's adding to her level of respectability, which of course she achieved in her own lifetime. She became quite famous and quite wealthy. And so she did kind of change celebrity culture for actors. This is Gainsborough's portrait of her, which does not really indicate that she would be working in any capacity. And it doesn't really imply that she's an actress at all, just a very wealthy and very fashionable woman. That's the drawing, that's the uh, sketch for the original piece. You can see he's really paid more attention just to her face and hair because she could use another model for the body and then deal with the clothing. This is a portrait of the exact same person by a rival portrait painter, Sir Joshua Reynolds. Personally, I prefer this one because I think it tells a little more about who she is and what she does. This is Sarah Siddons, but it's her as the tragic muse or the muse of tragedy. You know your uh, history of Shakespeare. Um, Shakespeare's plays are divided into two categories, either comedies or tragedies. So tragic muse doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to go bad, but it means she is what we would call in our... Uh, movie genres today, we would refer to this as a drama, right? So she's the muse of drama. So what you're seeing is a portrait that shows her in the act of performing a play, essentially. She is acting as this character, and she is surrounded by other figures. Pity and terror are behind her. Pity and terror are holding the dagger and the cup in that order, and those are symbols of one of the muses. So she is sort of the embodiment of the arts and of this art of emotive uh, storytelling through acting. Now, believe it or not, Sarah Siddons was still so revered and so famous into the 1900s that a fictional uh, acting award or theater award in a movie was named after her. You may be familiar with the actress Betty Davis, you may have heard of the movie All About Eve, and in that film they present an acting award, a theater acting award, that's the Sarah Siddons Award, and quite clearly it is based on this painting almost exactly re uh, replicated. Ironically enough, after that movie premiered, the Chicago theater uh, world decided to initiate an actual award that looks just like that and is called the Sarah Siddons Award. So there you go. Other portraits uh, by Reynolds, I think, really show his ability to do the fashionable thing of showing people in the territory that they own, but also his ability to capture perhaps more of their real personality than I think you see in a lot of Gainsborough's pieces. Reynolds also is a humorist somewhat in the vein of what Hogarth was doing. And you may sort of recognize this uh, composition. It's very much based on Raphael's School of Athens. It's a parody of British kind of stereotypes, but it really is based very much on that uh, image that we saw already in the Renaissance by Raphael. How strange is that? I definitely wanted us to think a little bit about the architecture of the Rococo in England. Again, it's a little bit more restrained and we tend to imitate the style of this architecture in America. You can see James Gibbs working in England is being imitated quite strongly in the piece below, which of course is uh, in Philadelphia. We've got uh, Philadelphia uh, Hall of Independence. Definitely wanted us to take a minute to look at Canaletto as well, and our last really big vocab term, veduta, or view painting. A view painting is basically like a picture postcard for us in the 21st century, but 
the Veduta paintings were made specifically as things that tourists would want to buy to commemorate having been in this place. So Canaletto was really smart. He painted, uh, especially in Venice, but throughout Italy, he painted Veduta paintings that would then be sold to British tourists who would come there. And he also made paintings in England of sites that Italian tourists would go to. So he did work both uh, cultures. What's kind of fascinating, though, is to think that during this time period, there was a movement or a tradition, I guess is a better way to say it, of education known as the Grand Tour. And the Grand Tour was all about um, making sure that a young person, as they were about to become an adult, became really worldly and, and well-rounded. And so especially British um, citizens of who had any uh, money or any um, solid background in, in society, not necessarily the uh, lower classes by any stretch, but certainly upper middle and upper classes. It was expected that you would make a tour, you would go on holiday or on vacation to Italy and you would tour Florence and Rome and you would see the works of uh, the Greco-Roman era and of course of the Renaissance and of the Baroque and you would absorb all of this culture and sort of bring that back to your experience as a cultured adult. Um, so the grand tour is something that has somewhat fallen by the wayside, although I suppose you could argue that um, some education systems encourage study abroad programs. You may have had um, students from other countries who um, were exchange students who lived in America and attended your schools while students from your school perhaps attended um, schools in their country. So that concept is somewhat the same, sort of. Um, Canaletto is definitely the master of the Veduta painting, and the ones that are probably the most spectacular are his images of Venice and of the canals. They're really beautiful. So the one to know uh, of his from the textbook is the base of San Marco from San Giorgio Marciori, which is looking out um, in across a canal toward a cathedral in the distance. We don't want to ignore uh, the artist Tiepolo, and Tiepolo's painting to know for the test purposes is the apotheosis of the Pisani family. He was perhaps the most famous Italian Rococo fresco painter, ceiling painter, kind of continuing this tradition into the late 1700s. And you can see again that that DeSoto and Sue scene from below effect is very much at play in this uh, style of painting. And you can see in these apotheosis, the word apotheosis means that the person has been elevated to godlike status. So apotheosis shows a soul being carried directly up to heaven as if they have become like somewhat higher than the angels, right? They've become almost members of the holy family. You can certainly see Rico excess in these examples. Tiepolo painted these scenes. Um, in the Kaiser Hall in Würzburg, the Imperial Hall. And you can see that the room itself is almost an oval. There's very, almost more decoration here than we've seen in any other building we've looked at. It's even harder to tell where the wall stops being wall and starts being ceiling because this is still vertical in here, but the curve hits this, and then we have another ceiling decoration here. But my favorite aspect of the Kaiser Hall is this aspect here, that the paintings, again, are not in rectangular frames, and it appears as if these little putti, these Cupid-like angels, have peeled the wall itself back to show us a view into space. Isn't that amazing? This hall of mirrors fits in exactly with what we've been looking at in terms of the Rococo architecture of excess. It's just astonishing. I don't think that I could stand living in it for very long, <laughs> but I think it would be beautiful to visit, for sure. Certainly you see that here in the uh, interior of the Opera House as well. It's just elegant beyond elegant. So the last piece, officially, to know um, is Assam's 
uh, sculpture, which is an altarpiece of the Assumption of the Virgin, Virgin being, of course, the Virgin Mary being carried up to heaven to become the Queen of Heaven. Check out this image from the side. You can really see that it's almost taken Bernini's idea and exploded it into full three dimensions. You can see the light coming in from the ceiling above. You can see carved marble clouds, and you can see this spectacle her mourners kind of being blown back from the tomb as her body is just carried straight upward. It's got metal rods from the back to support it, and you wouldn't really be able to get behind it, but it is a pretty remarkable accomplishment nonetheless.